topics, education and local education. Our guests tonight are two candidates for the Proviso High School Board of Education, District 209. Tonight we have Claudia Medina and we have Nathan Ned Wagner. And I can call you Ned throughout the show, right? That's correct, yeah. All right. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you for having us, Kevin. Well, and I should tell our, our audience first, in the terms of full disclosure, that I'm a sitting member of the board that you're running for. That's right. Right, so it's sort of like I'm the, I'm the teacher, you know, administering the exam here. You, you didn't have to pass before. I, <laughs> so you can actually Oral exam. Right. Oral exam, <laughs> right, these are the orals. Um, so anyway, well, uh, thank you for, for coming to the show. And uh, uh, let me start with you, uh, Claudia. Um, as with any candidate, uh, you know, you are running for some reasons and you have some qualifications. So let's start with your background. Sure. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, and, and why this is interesting to you. I'm fascinated with high school. I'm, I'm, first of all, my background is uh, a teacher. I've been a Montessori teacher now for over 25 years, and I've worked in many different capacities. I've worked as a, a teacher, of course. I've worked as a curriculum coordinator in, in the administration, and currently I do a lot of teacher training, and I sit on the advisory board for District 91. And I've learned a lot, and um, my children, uh, li are going to the public high school to the public uh, elementary school so I have a second a fourth and a sixth grader and high school is right around the corner and because I've been helping so many teachers I teach in several different countries I teach in the Czech Republic I teach in Spain I teach in Chile and I work with lots of schools that are in distress and as I look at the high school situation in Proviso I see that our high school is in severe distress so you mentioned Montessori, and right. a lot of us hear that word. I've heard that word any number mm -hmm. of times. Uh, what is different about Montessori education or Montessori schools from public schools, private schools? That's a great question, Kevin. Montessori education is really child-centered. And what we do as Montessori teachers is we observe the child, and we cater the education according to their age group, where they are developmentally, and we encourage learning because the child desires to learn. So we find what the child is really interested in and then they grow and Montessori education goes from zero all the way through high school. Um, it's, a, it's, it's very, very scientific and because the children are, are motivated, they go at a much higher speed through their curriculum. So they get a lot deeper into curriculum and it's a fascinating way of teaching. And really, engaged learning is what, it's life learning. And if you ask, how is that related to public education? Let well, me ask you, how is that related to public <laughs> education? Uh, yeah. there, what we want to have is engaged learners. And one of the issues that we have is we have a very low graduation rate in Proviso East and in Proviso West. PMSA is doing, is doing well. PMSA being the Proviso, the Proviso Math, Math and Science Academy is doing well. But we'd like all of the high schools to do excellent. And we're not... If according to the state standards, we are not to the state report card, we are not by any means in excellence. But it's attainable. I'm going to come back to um, a little bit of that in just a minute. But sure. uh, Ned, so tell us a little bit about your background and why you became interested in this as well. All right. So uh, for the last you know, 28 years, I've you know, been working um, really in social services, working with people with mental illness developmental disabilities. You know, I, I currently am in charge of Alzheimer's and dementia programs. Um, I have always been active in the community um, with you know, groups like Cub Scouts. I'm a leader in Boy Scouts, very active in Little League. I'm uh, the president-elect of the Forest Park Kiwanis Club. And Kiwanis is a, an organization that devoted to enriching opportunities for children in the community. So. My wife and I you know, moved into Proviso Forest Park you know, about 13 years ago. And our kids, we have two kids you know, in sixth grade and second grade in the Proviso Public Schools. But we have the same conversation that all the parents that live in Proviso and all the different towns of Proviso have. And the conversation is, well, what are we gonna, what are we gonna do about high school? And our high school district is failing our community and our children so profoundly that people, it's, it's literally tearing the fabric of our community apart. And it breaks my heart. And it's really, it's become my moral obligation to do something about it. A moral obligation. It's interesting to hear that. I mean, normally when we think of politics, the word moral doesn't enter into that very often. Uh, in fact, many people might say politics is the opposite of that. But it's interesting to hear you mm -hmm. use that terminology. Um, 
expand on that a little bit. Where, what is the moral obligation and how is, how is this framed then as a moral issue? Okay. In America, public education is a right and that right has been compromised in, our, in the Proviso High School District. People are afraid to send their children to a Proviso High School. And it's not, and, and as we talk to families in all the different, you know, communities that feed into the, the, the district, it's the, everyone is the same story. And people are moving out rather than going to a Proviso High School. Or they're getting a second mortgage on their house to pay for private school. Even though they're already paying taxes. Even, they're all, even though they're already paying taxes. Right. Yeah. So, uh, Claudia, do you uh, share that vision that this is, this is really a moral issue? It is a moral issue. And in my case, having seen so many schools excel and being so involved with curriculum and being involved with seeing children excel, to see that my neighborhood is failing generations of children because the high school does not even provide a future for these children just now, tears me apart. It makes it a Now, there, it's, it's a there are some show. students at, at um, the Proviso schools, not even including the math and science, but at Proviso East and mm -hmm. Proviso West, who actually do well. I mean, there are students who uh, go through advanced placement classes, mm -hmm. score well on the mm -hmm. AP tests, and go on to promising college and careers. But right. despite of the schools, not because of the schools. These children really look for opportunities. Um, but the schools are not going out of their way to give the support to the, to the students. So what needs to change? Ned, we'll come back to you. What, what is it that needs to change in order to um, give the opportunity that, that Claudia is talking about here? All right. The first thing that needs to change is the Board of Education needs to, well, first of all, politics is just plaguing the high school district. The, you know, the, it seems that, as I'm an, I'm an outsider looking in, you know, but there's politics is paralyzing the functioning of the board. And we need to, that's why, you know, Claudia and I and Teresa Kelly were, were running because we need to have a majority of, on the board of independent thinking citizens, not people who are, you know, owing a machine a favor or, you know, having their, you know, their decision making compromised, you know, politically. We need to have transformational inspirational leadership at the board level. We need to then demand that same expectation of the superintendent. We need an inspirational superintendent, inspirational principals and assistant principals, inspirational teachers and staff, then we can create an engaged and vibrant learning community where kids are excited to come to school. You know, a lot of the teachers are demoralized. More Ned and Ke Ms. Kelly and I have had an opportunity to speak to teachers, to speak to students. They've just lost that excitement for learning. And in education, it's, there's a trickle-down effect. When the board is for the children and the priorities are the children and the, the educational standards, because we need educational excellence, and when those standards and the bar is raised, the children will, will meet the bar that's set. And the tone for the school is set by the, the board. Do you think that the expectations are too low? Do you think the bar yes, is not high enough? the bar enough? is very low. And in speaking with some of the people at the Proviso schools, what they've done is they have admittedly lowered the bar so the children can meet it because they said the children can't meet the regular. But the state the standards are still above. So they're meeting the school standards, but the school standards are not meeting the state standards. And of course, not excelling to excellence. We need to raise the school standards in curriculum, in expectations for the students. And the students will have a difficult time at the beginning meeting that, but if we have the right support system, it's doable. I've seen it done before. I've done it myself. I've been involved in schools that have done that, risen the educational leadership standards. And when the leaders are supportive and listen to the teachers and the school becomes more child-centered, the children become very enthusiastic about learning. And when that happens, education becomes ignited. And we want to see that happening throughout the Proviso Township So one of the, all the kids. One of the things that we hear in Proviso, and I'm sure you've heard this as well, is that the, uh, the schools that feed the district, so the elementary schools that are sending students in, uh, are not preparing the students for, mm -hmm. for high school work. And so by the time they arrive at high school, they might be reading at, at a much lower level. Um, their overall skill level might be several grades behind where it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the 
question is, well, gee, the, the students coming in are ill-prepared, mm -hmm. so you know, what do you want us to do, really? This is what mm -hmm. we have to work with, and we're doing the best we can. Ned, what, what do you think about that? Claudia and I, and, and, and Teresa was at the uh, 209 uh, Articulation Summit. Uh, Which but, was what? So articulation is the process by where all the different school districts communicate and cooperate. So you have the high school district. One of the things that's very challenging about the 209 high school district is that there are quite there are several, five or six different elementary districts that feed into it. There are 10 communities. There's 10, ten, ten, ten communities, right. and there's 10, high, the 10 elementary districts? The, the, the districts more, yeah. have more schools than just one. So yeah, right. okay. So there's a lot of, and these are all independent, you know, political bodies. They can do, you know, whatever they want, you know, and they should, right? Uh, every elementary district can have its own philosophy, but at the same time, there have to be, there has to be cooperation and there have to be benchmarks. And I think that through articulation, and I think 209 has to take the lead, right? 209 is going to say, oh, you know what? When you're a freshman, this is where, you your, this is where your student needs to be. Okay? And we can't wait till eighth grade and say, oh, well, maybe we'll do a little summer program and get them ready for high school. So there has to be, and this is where it all comes down to transformational, inspirational leadership. Because we were at a uh, breakout, one of the breakout sessions. And frankly, it was exciting. We were surrounded by these teachers and principals, and you could feel the energy, and people had ideas. And you could sense that really they, they just needed to have permission to, to co do it. To do it. To collaborate. Let's do it. Let's talk about it. Because if you identify that, that student and maybe in second grade, say, like, oh, the, he's not up to grade level, oh, you, don't, you don't do nothing. Let's intervene now. And I think 209 can provide the leadership to inspire the elementary districts to do that. One of the issues that we found out at the articulation meeting is that there, are no, there is no um, district-wide curriculum. It just doesn't exist. Each one of the high schools also operates independently, um, as do all of the other districts that feed into it. Now, only 40% of the children really are coming in very low. But we have a high amount, a high percentage of children that just don't even come to our schools, which are prepared well, and they're prepared well by some of the other districts. But these children aren't coming to the high schools. They go to private schools. They go to private them. schools, they go to other schools, or they move out. Mm -hmm. So we are losing the fabric of our community. We're losing the brain power of our community. And so we have the ones that have no other choices. Those are the ones that come to the high schools. And what we'd like to do is if we raise the bar at our high schools, people are going to want to stay. It's going mm -hmm. to continue building our community, which is what we want to do. And, and honestly, the ignorance of the community, keeping a community ignorant is keeping them without a future. Mm -hmm. And this is what's happening, is the children that stay, are there, there's a sense of hopelessness with a lot of the students. And then related to that, one of my frustrations with the district is that I get no sense that District 209 cares that we've chosen not to use the high school. There's, I don't feel, oh, everyone. You mean, you mean there's no sense that the, the, the high school district the high school is district concerned district. that so many students go elsewhere? Exactly. exactly. Over 50% of the high school age kids in, in, in Proviso Township are not using a Proviso High School. And I, I've never felt someone say, come to me and say, why don't you want to use the high school? What, can, <laughs> what are you looking for in a high school? What can we do to make you want to use our high school? And that's what exactly what Claudia and myself would do and Teresa. It's like, we need to reach out. To the, it's going to take the entire township of Proviso to come together and say, you know what, we've had it, we can do better, let's make this happen. So uh, let me come back to the, the question, though, of, of students who come in unprepared. Transforming the, the elementary schools would, of course, take some time. And in the meantime, there will be students who come in who are not prepared for high school work. What can we do with that um, group of students? There are, search, there are things such as reading labs. There are all kinds of extra courses that can be done. And by the way, as, you've, you've done this before with some of your experience in Montessori schools, right? Oh, you've, absolutely. You've taken because students from uh, ill-prepared backgrounds. and Absolutely. And the children change dramatically. Children want to excel. And they get excited. And their attitude changes. And what you want to see are engaged learners. Because when you have a child that's engaged, they can, they can surpass any expectation. But if the children are not engaged in learning and they are demoralized, so how then how specifically? I mean, give me an example. This is how, a cultural thing. So what what is it? What are the two or three or one whatever it is things 
that have to happen in order to change the students from just kind of going through school and going through the motions and transforming them into students who are motivated and really want to learn. What elements make up that cultural change? First of all, the way the teachers teach. The, teach, the teachers, when teachers are supported, when teachers feel supported and they feel ignited on, in, with the class that they're doing and they feel that they're in a safe environment, the teachers are inspiring. And when a teacher cares and a teacher is inspiring within a classroom, it changes the way the children feel about what they're learning. It, you could, it could be chemistry, it could be physics, which kids go, ooh, science. But that one inspirational teacher that ignites their imagination, turns the light on, and kids just want to keep learning. This is the type of attitude that we need to bring into every single classroom. How does that start? The leadership that we have in the school. If the school is promoting the teachers, is promoting learning for the teachers, is bringing in articulation which is targeted to the issues that are occurring within the classrooms and listening to what it is that is occurring in the classrooms, where the teachers feel that they have a voice, that drives a school to excellence. So, Ned, all schools, and Proviso is no different, do have professional development. Uh, you know, teachers go to various trainings, there are uh, experts brought in, consultants brought in, and, and Proviso is no different. You know, there, oh, there, there are uh, professional development days and, and programs. Um, but we're not seeing the results that Claudia is talking about. Um, so what is it, what do we think we're missing? Where is this missing link here? If they're, if they're going through the motions or the, 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 um, the professional development is at least there in form and structure, mm -hmm. uh, but we're not seeing the motivations of the teachers um, and we're not seeing the transformation of the student performance, um, what else is missing? What do we need to add to the, to the mix? Well, I think what we have to add is trust. Um, in the, the five essentials, which is uh, it's a tool that, um, it's a survey tool that uh, schools in Illinois use. Um, and it's a comprehensive survey of all sorts of different, you know, areas of, you know, you know with student engagement, um, do teachers trust the principal, and, you know, it has many, um, many aspects to it. Now, in Proviso, especially let's say for uh, Proviso East, for, in, for instance, the level of trust that teachers have for the principal is like 5%. Like it's, and this is measured on the, the survey, right? This is measured on the survey, survey. right? This is, this is the, the teachers saying this. This isn't you know, outside looking and the teachers are saying that they don't trust your principal. And I think that, where does that come from? Where's the superintendent? Is the superintendent stepping in? Is the board expecting the superintendent to step in and say, what's going on here? Why, do, why, why are the teachers, why is, why is there this mistrust between them and the principal? And if they don't trust the principal, if they're demoralized by their supervision, well, their performance is never, go is never gonna improve. So once again, it, it seems like it starts at the board. You know, you know Madam Superintendent, what are you doing about this? You know, and that feedback is not coming from the board today. That, that it, you see, right? No, I don't see that. There's another issue as well that having to do with curriculum, and that is that the in, in interviewing some of the principals and in talking with some of the the directors of the different the departmental directors that uh, exist within the schools, what we found with Ned um, is that. The, the leadership meetings that occur within the school have operations, administration, and curriculum all together, which means that there's not a total focus on curriculum. When there isn't a focus on curriculum, there's not just a meeting directing curriculum, the different articulations or the needs that need to be brought forth mm -hmm. are not being discussed. And not being discussed, what's happening is a teachers, the teachers are now responsible for finding, oh, I'd like to go to this type of articulation, or I'd like to go to this professional development, and it's being picked. There's no strategic plan for the professional development to guide the whole school as a community and as a culture towards excellence, because it's, it, we're, they're not even organized yet. So what we would like to do is to bring that type of organization 
to the school so that we can separate some of the administrative, some of the operational, and some of the curricular um, meetings that are occurring so that they can be targeted and focused and we can set certain metrics and strategies for all of these different uh, parts or components of the school, but especially for the academic mm -hmm. excellence. If it's not targeted and if it's not focused and we don't bring all of the departments under full analysis um, and hire these benchmarks, then it's not going to be accomplished. And this is what keeps a lot of the students unmotivated and a lot of the teachers unmotivated. And this is something you've seen in practice in oh, the Oh, I've done it myself, you... yeah. I've, I've done this in other schools. And um, I've, I've led the, that type of program. So yes, I, I am aware of those um, strategies. Mm -hmm. And I would like to bring some of those ideas and perhaps help direct some of the focus within the school board so that we can bring those, we can raise those standards and it will make a huge difference for the students. And really what we're here for is for the students, for our community. So Ned, there, um, turning around schools has been studied by a number of academic institutions. A lot of, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of um, data about turnaround programs. Um, it's out there, you know, there, and there are programs that have been very successful and programs that, that have not been. Mm -hmm. uh, so. What's your sense about looking at some of these models and, and taking some of the models and seeing whether or not they are applicable in the proviso schools and, and, and picking and choosing amongst models and what's the importance mm. of the model right. versus what's the importance of the people implementing the model? Right. Here, for instance, um, we've had some discussions with the UIC uh, Urban Education, the Urban Education Institute. Mm -hmm. um, because we were curious, it's like, how do you turn around a school? Mm -hmm. okay. I, I don't. I'm like a you know a social service guy. I don't. I don't know how to turn around a school. Yet. Yet. Yeah. I'm learning fast now. And uh, you know, the director of the institute, you know, was more than kind enough to come out, and, and he was excited to meet with us. I mean, really excited that, oh my God, there's some people who care. They're, they want to turn around their school. They want to take a school that's a low-performing school and turn it into a high-performing school. This is like, you know, that's right up his alley, which made me really excited because, wow, there are resources. There are like passionate people that we could tap to like help us do this. So it's not just us against the world. And he laid out, you know, like a, sort of a general model that you know, had, you know, five points and it made kind of sense. Um, and he said, well, you have to hit like, you know, three of these. And, you know, um, one was, um, oh my gosh, Dude, what were those? And one was, well, leadership. Uh, one was uh, relationship with the community. One was uh, teacher engagement. Teacher engagement is the cooperative, cooperation of the decision making. Mm -hmm. Because if we're not aware of what it is that the teachers are actually seeing in the field, mm -hmm. how can we bring the changes right. that are true to the community? Right. Because a lot of it has to do with the culture mm -hmm. of, of the learning environment. And the, the models that are going to be applied really have a lot to do with the culture of the learning environment. Mm -hmm. So we've got a target, a plan, that really is going to enhance this particular community. And no school is identical. And there's not one clear fix. But what he, but what he said was, let's say if you have a, this five point model, you need, if you, could, if you can really raise three of those mm -hmm. points, you can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And they have a, the, like a joke, right? Well, it's really two plus one. You can pick any two of these five, but you have to have leadership. If you, if you don't improve the leadership, it doesn't matter what your model is. And if you do improve the leadership? Then um, you could use maybe whatever model would fit mm -hmm. the needs of your school. So this kind of finding the right model and, and finding the right leadership to get the model moving mm -hmm. um, sounds like a central tenet to, to trying to turn the, the, the schools around. Correct. Uh, so. Let's come back to the question of leadership. Now, uh, we've, that's come up a couple of times in the discussion. Um, and Ned, you just said that the, you know, without the right leadership, the model doesn't matter. Right. And with the right leadership, a number of different models might work, right? Yeah. Um, so what is it about the quality of the leadership, and particularly at the board level, that has to be there in order to make this transformation? Claudia? It has to be cooperative. There has to be transparency. And there has to be accountability. And to expand on accountability, what, what does that mean in this context? In this particular conte context, if there, is, uh, if there is a standard that is, imp that is required of the superintendent, because the, the board only directs the superintendent. They are the only employee of the school board. 
So if there's something is implemented, there needs to be follow-up. So if there's a program, we need to know what the results mm -hmm. are. We need to know what the goal is. Do we need to know where they're going? How mm -hmm. are they heading? Why are they doing it? So there needs to be accountability in, in, in why they're choosing it. And strategic it, accountability. A strategic accountability. And there needs to be a strategic plan so it's not just a lot of uh, separate dots, but there is a reason and a plan and a strategy. And we're, mm -hmm. everything that we implement is going towards the excellence of the school. Um, so let me t mm -hmm. talk about strategy for a second. Sure. So you both mentioned strategy. Mm -hmm. So Ned, what would a strategic plan look like? What are we talking about really with that kind of plan? Okay. For the strategic plan, you have to have, like the buzzword is like smart goals. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So that means when you have a, you set a goal, it needs to be, what is Specific. S specific, measurable, achievable, realistic. realistic, and timely. Okay, so you have to have all five of those elements. You can't just say, okay, we're going to improve uh, and you get the, test the scores. the idea that I've, I've heard this term before, right? So it's, I'm it's, yeah, able it's, to recite yeah. it to you. Yeah. Thank you for helping me with that. So, so first of all, you have to have those goals in place. You have to have a way to measure them. Um, and then you have to, you don't, you don't just like set these plan in place and then, oh, Oh wow, 11 months later, it's like, oh yeah, we should really look at our progress. Okay, so a strategic plan is something that is going to inform our decision making throughout the year. We're always constantly evaluating our, the benchmarks that we've set and you know, how we're making progress um, and, and picking the right goals. You know, it's not just a matter of like some cookie cutter goal. It's like using, because there's so much information about, let's say, let's say for instance, um, they need to be progressive goals. They need to be progressive goals. And they also need to be, they could be really, let's say um, one of the problems is, oh, there's, there's a trust issue. How, how are we going to address that? Okay, let's, let's, make, let's set a goal mm -hmm. for that. You know, um, we need to get you know, achievement, you know, the percentage of students meeting and exceeding standards up. Okay, well, how are we going to do that? And how can... Month by month. So this strategy, if, if it were in place, then what is the role of the board in enforcing that strategy? The, uh, the board needs to make sure that the superintendent is accountable to each one of the progressive steps that are put in place and that we can see results that are measurable and that we can actually um, keep record of the progress. When, when principals and superintendents are given the opportunity to have these measurable goals and, goals and they're in place such that they're realistic, attainable, and increasing step by step. The school starts to change. Mm -hmm. And the community starts believing in us again. Because part of the problem is we've had, we have a disengaged community as well. The parents are not participative within a lot of the things that have to do with the, with the school. But if they see progress, they see us engaging the students, the community becomes more engaged. We hope that we can keep a lot more community members as well. And the board is going to be instrumental in keeping all of those measurable goals mm -hmm. being so, accomplished. 30 seconds left. Ned, why should people vote on April 7th is the election, right? Mm -hmm. So on April 7th, why should they vote for Nathan Ned Wagner, Claudia Medina, and Teresa Kelly, who unfortunately couldn't make it tonight because of a family emergency? Okay. Um, why should people vote for your ticket? All right. People should vote for our ticket because we are three independent thinking um, people who have demonstrated a commitment to the children of our community. We are not beholden to any political interest. We are here only for that one reason, which is to provide excellent high school education for our community. I couldn't have summed it up better myself. Right. Ned, Claudia, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your taking the time. Thank you, Thank Kevin. you so much for having us, Kevin. And thank you for watching Public Perspective. Once again, I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. You can see us every Saturday night at 8 on Comcast Channel 19, and you can find us on the web at publicperspective.tv. So until next time, thank you, and good night.